Good morning, folks. How's everyone doing? Cool. Welcome. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, connected clients and continuous services with uh, Windows Azure Service Bus. I'm uh, Abhishek Lal. I'm a program manager with uh, the Windows Azure team. I specifically work on the messaging and uh, service bus related features for Windows Azure. How many folks here are familiar with the uh, service bus features? Excellent, lovely. So you guys already know that we have features like queues, topics, relays available out there today. And we are seeing people use them for the traditional sort of connecting services like uh, you know, SharePoint sites or uh, database services relayed over from their web apps. But a lot more types of clients are showing up. Phones, tablet PCs, point of sale kiosks, household appliances. And all of them need to connect back to the same kind of uh, services, line of business services, event aggregators for telemetry, and things like that. So Service Bus is the messaging fabric. It's the, it's the glue which people are using to connect all these things together. So in today's talk, I want to go over all the different challenges which you face when you're trying to connect clients and write resilient continuous services which those clients talk to. And then we'll, for each of the areas, go over and see how Service Bus is going to help you solve some of those challenges. Uh, keep this as interactive as uh, possible. Uh, raise your hand. Any questions you have, we'll, we'll uh, address those right away. So from a core messaging perspective, you're already aware that we have queues and topics and subscriptions. Queues are for one-on-one -on -one communication, and when you need one-to-many, you use topics and subscriptions. Generally, when you're connecting two roles, say a web role, a worker role, or an on-premise service with a client, putting a queue and topic in between gives you a good amount of scale out. What it means is that you are independently able to scale both your nodes. You can separate out your web workload and your worker workload, and now there is a single sort of queue in the middle or a bunch of queues in the middle which can help you scale both of those things independently. Having this architecture adds resiliency. Your backend role may be unavailable for hours together, and your web roles can continue to work with no disruption because all they are doing is putting messages in the middle tier. So that is another advantage which you get. You get rich messaging patterns. For example, if you're doing content-based routing or you need to do deduplication, a lot of these core messaging things, uh, recipient list kind of addressing, are all possible to do when you use queues and topics within your services. From an advanced features perspective, you already know we have durable messaging. We also have something called sessions, which allow you to do state storage and thereby make your service, both front end and back end, as stateless as possible. This is a huge challenge in cloud, right? That you have uh, roles which might you know, go away or services which might crash. You don't want to store state in them. So Service Bus gives you that durable state machine to actually store your information. Some advanced features like deduplication, transactions, batching, these let you do good message uh, uh, processing. Deduplication is very good for services which are not item potent. You don't have to build item potency in them. You can say, hey, I'm going to rely on a single message, um, and we provide dedupe for that. Few more capabilities uh, available to you are uh, scheduling with the TTL of messages, so you can do event-based stuff where you say, hey, every uh, midnight I want to start something. You can put a scheduled message in for that, and things like that. And then auto-forwarding, dead lettering, all these core messaging concepts are all available in service bus queues and topics. For hybrid solutions, let me call out what I mean by hybrid. Hybrid is essentially when you're connecting something in the cloud to something on-premise. 
from the hybrid has a lot of connotations, a lot of meanings. From this uh, talk's perspective, a hybrid solution is just something in the cloud with something on premise. By adding relays, queues, and topics to talk between cloud services and talk between your uh, on premise uh, solution, you get location transparency. Think of this as wherever your client is, it doesn't matter. The on-premise system could be located across different geographies. The cloud system could be located in a different geography. It just doesn't matter. Relay queues topics help you give, get that location transparency. NAT traversal. So you know Service Bus has an outbound connection, which means you don't need to reconfigure your VPN for any inbound ports or your network firewalls for any inbound ports. So you get that advantage by using uh, Service Bus. Scale out is possible, and uh, we'll talk about scale out and uh, uh, resiliency in terms of relay today in more detail because it's really, really relevant from a services uh, perspective. But the same things apply with queues and topics. You can uh, keep adding more roles. Your on-premise system can uh, be processing at a slow, steady rate, whereas your uh, cloud uh, system could be generating a lot of load, and the queue will just grow and shrink and absorb that, allowing you to scale out. With Relay, you get turnkey Cloud Connect. So what it means is you have a service. It's running on your premise. You need someone somewhere to connect to that service. With Relay, all you do is change configuration on your WCF services, and you have a cloud endpoint available where someone can go connect on that. You never had to put a VPN for them. You can manage security on that endpoint. Really, really convenient and um, easy. And then resiliency, like I mentioned, really supports load balancing. So it means you can have multiple services or multiple instances of the same service connected to a single address. And we'll see some of that today, how that really helps add resiliency. And then, of course, there's messaging patterns, which uh, people do pub sub. They want to do, let's say, addressing based on departments, addressing based on customers. If you're just doing routing, you get pub sub routing messaging patterns. So what about connected clients? Before we go to uh, connected clients, any questions, thoughts about what, we, what, I pres what I talked about till now is stuff which is already available in Service Bus. We're going to talk about connected clients today, but if there are any questions about uh, uh, pub sub messaging or relay. Cool. So, more and more today, your uh, workforce is becoming mobile. You have mobile devices, phones, laptops, tablets. Bring your own device, which adds uh, the, the platform uh, sort of uh, concept. You can have different types of devices. So folks are uh, bringing in uh, uh, different platforms which they choose. And then there are the machine-to-machine -machine sensor network. So when I talk about connected clients, I'm talking about this entire uh, spectrum of uh, clients. There are several messaging challenges which are presented because of this, uh, this uh, shift. The first part is you want to build modern and engaging applications for all of these platforms. So each of these devices which comes in is now a client for your line of business application. How do you make it engaging? How do you make it modern? People expect that from their apps now. Another challenge is location transparency. I should be able to access all my information and application from anywhere, whether it's on the, I am on the corporate network or I'm outside the corporate network. The same thing is applying to sensors and devices today, where uh, the, maybe a power meter needs to put telemetry data into your database or into your storage. And folks are sometimes giving VPN access to every sensor out there to their network. You don't need to do that. There is services like Service Bus which will give you that location transparency without the use of VPN. Heterogeneous clients. So this is the part about platforms. You have so many types of clients. You have so many types of devices. How do you deal with all of those when you're thinking of a messaging system? Addressability is key. 
when anyone logs in from a web role, it's great because you know they're going to put in their login information, they're going to sign up, and you know you've got your session going. What happens to these devices, apps, and clients? No one's logging in per se, right? You need to address each of them. You need to talk to each of them. Connectivity itself, just the fact of how do you get so many clients, the sockets, to just connect in, uh, in terms of uh, providing these services. And security and resilience. Fairly obvious, clients are occasionally connected. They don't have you know, the same kind of guarantees in terms of service, network availability, what you uh, traditionally see with PCs. And uh, security is, uh, is a key concern. So today, in this talk, we will cover all of these messaging challenges. We'll walk through one by one and sort of talk about what are the um, uh, scenarios which we are seeing from customers and how we are providing some uh, solutions to each of those. Questions till now? So engaging applications. The first thing you see with mobile devices is push notifications, right? So push notifications really help people feel engaged because it's mobile. Now you're, you know, you're walking around. You're not always connected. But uh, you're always able to receive a SMS, or you're able to receive a push, a toast, a badge, a tile update. Your apps appear alive. Windows 8 apps are alive because of tile updates and um, uh, toast notifications. For these notifications, you have to support heterogeneous platforms. It cannot be only on a per device basis because people bringing their own devices and companies adopting different platforms, you have to have notifications go to all different platforms. Along with the challenge that different platforms have capabilities which are different and protocols which are different, you also on your back end have to manage the fact that Devices keep moving around, so their channels keep changing. And also, specifically, the platform's specific protocols from your back end to talk to the notification systems are, uh, are different. So keeping all of these in mind, we provided a feature called Notification Hubs. Notification Hubs is in a preview, available right now. You don't need your sub subscription to be enabled or you know, signed up or anything. You can just go to the uh, uh, Windows Azure portal, sign, uh, sign up for a service bus namespace if you don't have any, and create it. We'll walk through all of those uh, uh, steps today. So Notification Hubs is a solution which we're providing for building these engaging applications. How many folks here are familiar with Notification Hubs already? Got a couple of hands. OK. Uh, how many folks here are interested in push notifications for mobile applications? OK, good. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to deep dive into notification hubs, see how you solve those problems, and also walk through some of the key advantages which we provide with them. How does a push notification work? Well, push notification works in, in the following way. This is across platforms. So uh, Apple, Android, uh, Windows, this is a canonical uh, uh, solution. All of the platforms work in this way. When your app launches, your mobile app contacts the push notification service. This is generally exposed to you as part of any of the native APIs. iOS has an API. Windows has an API. We'll see all of those today. When they contact the APNS service or the WNS service, they get back a client ID. That's the address. They get back a, a, a device token that says, here's how you can talk to me. Most of the time, the app will hand that back to a backend. That's your SharePoint app. That's your website. That's your worker role. That's your line of business app, which wants to then reach out and touch this customer, send them a push notification. The app has to launch, get the ID, and give it to your backend. The next step is when your backend decides, based on some event, some time, some trigger, some workflow, that, hey, now I want to contact this particular person. At that point, it will take that particular device ID, contact WNS, 
APNS or Android with GCM, Google Cloud uh, uh, messaging. Appropriately, whichever one you want to send the message to, speak their platform and their protocol, and then send a notification. Now, your client app is always connected to the uh, push notification service. So here's the key. You don't have to manage any sockets. Every device here, uh, the iPad, uh, my, um, you know, a Windows phone, all of these are constantly connected to the push notification services. When that notification goes through, it uses that particular socket, and it will send the notification to the device. Finally, you might get a knack back from the APNS, say, hey, the device token you pointed to me is old. It's no longer valid. It's gone. Or I can't talk to that machine anymore. So then your backend has to do some amount of maintenance and manage that. So fairly complex, right? I mean, two or three key problems you have to solve. You have to solve the cross-platform issue. Depending on which you know, device you're talking to, you have to manage their registrations and then uh, you know, the notification itself. So these key uh, challenges with push notifications is what we are addressing. So let's talk about each of them in a little detail. The platform dependency is interesting because each PNS has a different protocol. So let's say you have a SharePoint app, and you want to send a notification to Apple devices. You have to speak TCP. If you have to send a notification to Windows devices, you have to speak HTTP. It's fairly different in that sense. They might have payload differences. One uses XML, one uses JSON. So all this logic now starts percolating into your app if you don't have a comprehensive solution available to you. They have different presentation formats. Uh, tiles on a Windows machine, a badge on a Apple. All these are very, very different formats. How do you do routing? Generally, you don't think of each device, right? At best, you would think of a single user. And even a single user will use many devices. So, so you really have to figure out the pub-sub problem. How do you, you know, send a message to a set of folks? And then finally, the key aspect is of scale. So think of it in this way. Let's say uh, uh, most of the time you're dealing with, uh, say, uh, 100, 200 employees. Uh, does anyone here have uh, scenarios where you would be maybe reaching out to 1,000 employees? Few. Let's say if you're going to the consumer, you start at thousands, right? Anyone has scenario where you might say 10,000 consumers need to be sent a notification? Maybe not. Maybe one person. But from a push notification service, if you want to send 10,000 people a notification, you have to send 10,000 messages. To the, to the notification service. If it's TCP, maybe you'll even have a at least persistent connection. But with HTTP, you're making 10,000 REST calls, you know, HTTP calls to send those messages. How do you scale that? And you want to do it in low latency because notification happens to happen instantly. So all of these challenges in mind is what we have solved with Notification Hub. Let's see what Notification Hub's experience looks like. A one-time hub uh, creation. You go to the portal, you sign up a uh, service bus, you create a hub. Now you have a hub in there. This hub will get the credentials for your application. So each APNS, WNS will uh, provide you credentials and say, if you want to send messages, use these credentials. You store them in the hub. You store them in one place. When your devices come up, remember the registration step when they have the handles, and now they need these handles to be available to you? You don't have to manage them anymore. All the handles are stored by us now. These devices just talk to the hub and say, hey, this is my device ID. Ah, good. So the question is, is it a single handle per app or device? Uh, there are a couple of ways to look at it. From a handle perspective, it's very unique to an app and device combination. That's what you get. But from a registration perspective, we give you PubSub. So you can register with tags, 
which says, hey, I am interested in this and this and this. So there's a layer of PubSub, which we provide on top of just a device and a person combination. Ah, good. So the question is, what if you want to notify a whole device, not an app on the device? That is not possible because the notification services are only available to store apps. So the, the, the key part where you go contact the push notification service and you get a device handle, only a store app can do. A Windows store app or an Apple store app or a Google Play app, only those apps which are in that store can go and get that address. Hence, that's the scenario. Now, the registration happens against the notification hubs. You just connect to us, you do register. And then, when it comes time to send a notification, you don't have to worry about how many backends, how many, sorry, how many platform types, how many people are registered, what is the scale. You send a single message. You send a single message to the service bus notification hub. We will go out, talk to each of the push notification services at scale, low latency and send out those notifications. So with that, I want to jump into a demo. I, uh, given how many folks here are really interested end-to-end, -end, I was hoping to, I'm going to start from scratch. How many of you folks have written Windows Store applications? A couple, OK. So I'll, I'll start from scratch, plain vanilla, and uh, ask questions, uh, you know, anything which uh, you see. So let me start Visual Studio. I'm going to go create a Windows Store app, just a blank application. Correct. Great. So the question was, how do you create uh, groups of interested devices? And I'll show that. It's tags. We essentially do filtering with tags. So you, you sign up and you say, hey, I'm interested in this tag. And then when you send a notification, you say send it to this tag or you know, any number of tags. Exactly. So it's very similar to a topic and a subscription, where every subscription is a tag name, and you can send to a tag. Absolutely correct. So the backend service, when sending a notification, just says send it to the stack, and that's it. it. You could be sending it to a million folks. You could be sending it to all different platforms. You could be sending it to you know all of those particular things. Now, I do want to call out the other scenario when you want to address only one person. So a single device can register with up to 60 tags. So one of the tag can be a username, right? One of the tags can be the username and device, or something like that. So when you say, hey, I want to send this guy, this one person a notification, you can, you, need, uh, you can send that unique tag value also. So both of those scenarios are supported. So here I have a plain vanilla app. There are a couple of things you need to do in this application. Uh, let me do that really quick by opening the package manifest. The first thing I'll do on this app is say, hey, I'm I'm fine with sending me toast notifications. So here in the badge logo, you go and say yes, and now you're set for receiving toast notifications. The other thing you need to do in the app, like I said, is you need to associate it with the store. You can sign in with your uh, live ID. And uh, here, what I'll actually do is let me go uh, create a brand new application so that you guys see those steps also. There we go. So, Go and let me do Com. 
windows stored down. There we go. So, start building apps. Actually, I already have a profile, so I'm just going to use that. on reserve name. So, here you give it the app a name. I'm going to call it TechEd Live Demo. I hope someone's not taken that. Good, I got that. So, there's the app name. You do have to provide the selling details. I'm just going to say this is going to be a free app. Actually, I should charge a lot for this. Pick a category, productivity. And then finally, in services, this is where you enable the fact that you can use push notifications. So identifying your app, this is the credentials. Now that I've created an app in the store, it will show me that. And then authenticating your service, these are the credentials which you will need to actually send the push notification. So now that you've got all that ready, we come back here and notice TechEd Live Demo has shown up on my uh, uh, associate uh, screen. I'm just going to select that, click next, and say associate. Done. At this point, I have a Windows Store app, which has a hook in the App Store, and I can send push notifications to this app. So let's see what does it look like actually doing some um, uh, notification here. Let me go to the main page here and add a little bit of UI. And here I'm going to open some code. So here what I'm doing in the UI is I'm going to take in a, a user ID, just a string from a user, and say login and register for push. Let me click here, navigate to event handler, and when you actually click Note what I need to do here. This is the single line call which is available to all your uh, applications, which will get you that notification channel. Ah, it needs to be awaitable, so let me get that. Just, uh, And that's it. So now I have an application. It's associated with the store. I've, whenever the application launches, I click this button. It will go and get that uh, device handle. Excellent. Uh, we, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So now, now is a good time to go and create the hub. So let's see what, what is all the steps involved in actually going and creating a notification hub. I'm going to go to service bus. You can see I already have a bunch of namespaces. You can easily create a namespace. And once I'm in a namespace, I'm just going to do new app services notification hub quick create. Let me call this the live demo hub. You can choose which data center it goes into. Anyone's fine here. Choose which namespace and I say create hub. So at this point, I'm provisioning that notification hub in the cloud, and it's ready already. So let me go into the live demo hub. And now this hub already, when I do view SAS keys, gives me listen permission and send permission. This is what I will use to talk to the hub itself. And in the configure tab of the hub, is where now I can provide my app's information. Because that's what my hub will use to go talk to that application. So right here where we had signed up on the Windows Store, uh, right here, 
I, pro I got these two pieces of information by associating my app with the store. So I'm going to copy this. Put this in here. Copy the client secret. Put this in here. And at that point, I can hit save. It will upload my WNS credentials. Whoops. That didn't look right. Sorry, one second. Ah, much better. Nice. So I have a hub in the cloud. The hub is now able to talk to my app. What's next? Let's hook these two things up. The first piece of code I'll add is to my application itself, which is to create the registration. Now that I've already got the registration value from, uh, uh, from my push notification server, I'm going to take that value and I'm going to create a uh, registration out of it. So let me paste this code here. I use a connection string. Ah. So here is when I need to add my service bus client library. It's all available through NuGet. Really easy to do. Reference, manage NuGet. Windows Azure dot messaging. And I'm going to use the managed client for this. Absolutely. So uh, we've got developer walkthroughs in all of those languages available on windowsazure.com. And the difference, instead of using NuGet, will be downloading the Xcode, which you would include in your app and use it to register. So you have to download the Using the native app platform. No, absolutely. So the question is, do we use every platform's native capabilities? Absolutely. And as we'll go ahead and we'll see that if you're sending to Apple, you can send a badge. If you're sending to Windows, you can do all the different types of tiles for Windows. So every platform's native capability is supported. The idea with the hub is to make it easier for you, but not take away any of the power. You still have all the power available. Now, if you want to send a single message, which does a badge update on Apple and does a tile update on uh, Windows, you can do that with a notification hub. Send a single message and do that. And we'll see some of that. Uh, the question is whether, if I know anyone who's done this with Monotouch with this uh, package, I'm not uh, uh, clearly aware of that, but I can find out that information. Okay. So now I've added uh, some uh, references, which is to my uh, um, messaging client library. And you will see it will resolve all of these classes really quick. OK, good. So what am I doing in this code? First, I'm creating a connection string to my service bus notification hub, create a hub client, refresh the channel URI, which I just got from the push service, and just create a native registration with the value which the user passed me. So that I'm going to do with here. I'm going to call this the user ID dot text. This is the UI text, and here we'll call it string P. And that's it. In these four steps, I have now created my registration with the notification hub. Let me quickly correct this info. I call this the live demo. That was the name of the hub. And I need the right connection string. So I'm going to go back to my hub here. Uh, dashboard, view SAS key. Oops. Actually, yeah. I'm going to do view connection string. And I'm going to take the SAS connection string here. Oh, actually, I can just use the key. Let me do that here. So here. 
is my new key value. There we go. Uh, let me check the name, maybe lol demo, that works fine. And done. Okay. So now the app side is done, right? We've got an app, it's making a registration. How do I send a message to it? So for a super simple backend, I'm just going to take the same project and I'm going to add a console app. And I'm going to say, hey, this console app is going to serve as my backend. And here, let me again just copy over a little bit of code. Let me do references to. Here I'm going to use Windows. Uh, actually, I'm going to use service bus. So here you can see I'm using a different library. Because this is for the backend, it's the full .NET library. So this works on .NET 4.0. You can put this in your MVC app, you can put it in your SharePoint app, whatever your backend app is. And here, as a backend, all I'm going to simulate is say, create the same kind of endpoint. Uh, this was live demo. I need my key to be correct here. Actually, I can use my full connection string. So quickly grab the connection string from here. Copy. OK. So here I authenticate against the hub. I take a particular text, and all I do is hub.send Windows native notification just a single line to send the notification to the hub. Let's give this a try. Actually, let me start the console app also. OK, so here's my backend running, and here's my app running. Let's see, I'm going to use lal, do login and register for push. So what this should have done is gone and to the notification hub, given it uh, my uh, channel URI. And now if I switch back to my client, I can say, hello there, and hello there. So really, really quick, end to end, you can see how easy it is with four lines of code on your client, four lines of code on your back end. And now I, if I have the same uh, demo app here on push, I could send the same notification on the I Apple iPad. All I'd have to change here is say, oops. Hub client dot send Apple native notification. And at the same point, the earlier part we were talking about where you could do pub sub, you don't even care what kind of clients you are uh, using. You can do just a send notification or a send template notification. And we'll talk about those in detail too. Okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. Oh, not bad. So uh, so essentially what we've just seen is all the advantages of using notification hubs. You didn't have to do any platform-specific protocols. You didn't have to store device information locally. I didn't need to create a database. I didn't need to create anything. I could do broadcast notifications, or I could do pub sub. And that's the part with tags and routing. So here's a little bit on uh, tags. Every time you want to create a registration, you can send a tag along with it. Tag is just a string, any string. And then when the app backend sends you a message, it can do a tag on that message too. And that's as simple a pub sub string filter matching that is available for you to achieve these scenarios. So here are a couple of examples of what you could use. Like we were talking about, you could use the user ID or a device ID and things like that too. 
you can do templates for multi-platform push. What does that look like? So if you want a toast notification to appear on a Windows uh, uh, app, you can do a template registration. If you want a badge to appear on the app, on Apple, you do a template registration, which looks something like that, both native to each platform. The key part being that the send message notice has nothing specific to the platform. It just says, I have anywhere you find the key message, replace it with hello. And in one case, it will do it for the toast. In one case, it will do it for the badge and go with that. And it also supports uh, payloads which you want to send natively. So each of these platforms has a way of called native uh, stuff where you can just get the direct message to your app. That is also supported with notification hubs. So like I said, you don't compromise on any power. You only get a lot of ease and simplicity. Another key problem we solve for you is scale. So today, in preview itself, we give you up to 10,000 registrations on any notification hub. You don't need to shard them even up to a million. It's just that in preview, we've not al allowed that. If you need it, just give us a call. Throughput and latency, we will scale out that for you, where you have hundreds, tens of thousands of notifications, and we'll uh, manage the uh, throughput and latency for that. I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides in the interest of time. But overall, I just wanted to uh, ensure that you saw how easy it was to use notification hubs and get the rich value. Location transparency. That's the next problem we'll talk about. So with Service Bus Relay, essentially you get secure access to your services from anywhere. Your service can be running locally. It projects an endpoint in the cloud through NAT traversal. And in a single change of your binding, just changing from a net TCP binding or whatever your WCF binding is to a relay binding, you have a really, really fast time to market to make that service available. You can use brokered messaging for location transparency. And the idea being is your apps talk to each other using the broker in the middle which is using PubSub and messaging. All common PubSub patterns are supported, as well as advanced messaging features like delivery guaranteed, sessions, scheduling, as we talked about, are all available. It is optimized for hybrid apps because these also support both NAT traversal, as well as we have a WCF binding for brokered messaging too. So you can easily use those. And finally, there's broad uh, platform reach, uh, which is available. So the key part is, if I use these solutions, what are the platforms that my services and my clients need to run on? And we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Platform reach is really the heart of heterogeneous clients. If you have so many types of devices and types of clients, you need that broad platform reach. So let's see how Service Bus gives that to you. Service Bus is a cloud service available uh, you know, on uh, Azure. It's also available on-premise as a Windows, uh, Service Bus for Windows Server. What it supports is natively TCP protocols, which today is a proprietary uh, protocol which uh, we started off with, as well as HTTP access. Now, at protocol level with TCP and HTTP, you get sort of best of both worlds, where if you're looking for high throughput messaging, you're looking for some very, very rich features, you would only get that on a fully connected protocol like TCP. Think of long polling. Think of making a receive call which lasts for two days, 10 days together, and you'll get the receive call return only when the message shows up. That's only possible with TCP. With HTTP, you get broad platform reach but you don't get long polling, say, longer than a couple of minutes and things like that, but you get really a lot of reach. AMQP is the solution for both of these kinds of uh, problems. It's a TCP-based binary protocol, but it is a standard protocol. OASIS has ratified the AMQP 1.0 standard, so it really falls in the realm of reach as much as it falls in the realm of performance. If you want to use it for reach or you want to use it for performance, EMQP is best of both worlds. Gives you the best of breed for both. 
We've created client libraries in Python, PHP, Node, or any other HTTP language for these. So that makes it easy from any language for you to consume service bus. Send messages, receive messages. At the same point for .NET and AMQP, we've got our full .NET API, the full feature-rich API, as well as net messaging binding for the service model. With AMQP, you are already seeing Apache produce the Proton C client, as well as a C, C++ client, which is uh, for uh, embedded devices too. As well as now you have JMS providers from uh, Apache Cupid project. So from a languages and platforms perspective, now you're seeing all these libraries come up which can support very, very good feature-rich uh, sort of uh, functionality across a lot of platforms. So clients and applications, whether you're writing them for Windows on .NET or you're writing on any other platform, including Windows with non-.NET, you can use Service Bus to uh, connect and uh, sort of program in your own language. So really, heterogeneous clients are very, very well supported across Service Bus. Windows Store app. So here I wanted to show you a really quick demo. I'm not going to build the app here. We're just going to use one of the solutions which I have. So here, the scenario which I'm showing you is a point of sale application. You want to build a point of sale app on a Windows Store uh, uh, platform. You have a tablet, you have sales folks uh, walking around with tablets. And what you want to do is essentially take orders. So here I run the app and So I can buy some uh, products. This is touch enabled, so I can do, you know, buy some of uh, the products in there. And then I can go and submit that particular order. Now again here, your tablet is occasionally connected. You want a durable store. Each order submission can be a loss in monetary value if it's not saved. Let me dock that to the side, bring back the code. So notice what I'm doing here is for each of the orders which are being submitted, I'm dropping them in a topic. So each order, and let me actually show you the code too. It's a single line of code where it says orders topic is a data collection topic. And every time I do submit order, it sends a message. Send a sync, and the order is submitted. So on the data collection topic, I have a single audit subscription which captures all messages. So look at the top right here you have uh, nine messages available right now. And if I go select some products and hit submit order, you will see I can come back here and refresh. And 10 messages. There we go. So very, very simply, you can write an app, which is nice, touch enabled, on Windows RT platform and submit orders on a durable store. What about the other way around? The other way around is on these clients, you want to go push out to them and give them information. So I have a catalog update topic for which when this app launched, it created a subscription. Let me look really quick. Here's the CUS app, uh, the app solution, uh, subscription for it. And notice right now it has zero messages here in there. If I send a test message to it, and I've got it hooked up in, in that way is, it will go and update the catalog based on that message. So here, I'm just going to do send a test message. And notice on the left-hand side how we have a fixed list of products right now. And once the message is sent, come on. There we go, much better, OK. Once the message is sent, now you have all the new products which are available. So both two-way communication, whether you want the app writing into the topic or you want subscriptions per um, application instance are available, and all from a Windows RT application. Okay.
continuing on. Addressability. We generally see four different patterns of addressability. Direct, one-on-one, -on -one, pub sub, fan in and fan out. So these are the four different things generally people want to do when you think about addressability. From an event and control flow, most of the time you can see from devices into the system, you have event flow. And from devices out, uh, sorry, from the backend system out is what the control flow looks like. And for both of these scenarios, you can see control flow will generally be one to one or one to few, whereas event flow will be a fan-in kind of uh, scenario. The way we support these today, for direct addressability, you can use queues and topics, as well as notification hubs, like I talk about with one tag. I've got a lot of detail in here, which I've included in terms of how do you think about sharding, how do you think about uh, addressing. I won't uh, cover that in too much detail. But essentially, one-to-one -one messaging is sort of the easiest pattern because you, know, you can use a queue, you can use a topic with a single subscription, or you can use a tag per user. For PubSub, though, now you, have, you move into the realm of topics. And notice all the different options that we provide you. If you're using sort of per-instance filters, you would use correlation filters, which allow you up to 100,000 filters per topic. Each topic gives you 2,000 subscriptions. So depending on how many devices you're trying to target, you would then start sharding across multiple uh, topics. With notification hubs, you can target particular groups with tags. And each registration can do up to 60 tags. So you can see it can have up to 60 interests which it expresses. And that you can use to do different kinds of pub sub with it. Finally, with the fan out or broadcast, we have the ability to take and chain large number of topics and subscriptions. This is using forward to. If you're looking for a lower latency way or throughput increases, then you can just shard across topics. And with notification hubs, you get that sort of for free because you can just broadcast to all registrations. If you send no tag, it basically means send to everyone. So you can do a bunch of fan out scenarios with that. Here's just a system showing what it would look like if you were sharding across topics, not chaining topics together. For fan in telemetry, again, you get queues and topics where you can push in messages to. And this is telemetry is mostly durable, so notification hubs is not an interesting scenario here, because you want to store that telemetry data or do some event processing on it. And this is what sort of a scaled out with multiple partition system would look like. So here you can think you can keep creating new stamps where topics are available for you to send in telemetry data from more and more devices. And then each subscriber can have its own stamp too where it is pulling in that data. And then some aggregation of that information is what you could do some uh, you know, uh, key aggregation on in there. Connectivity. Let's talk about connectivity considerations. So brokered, relay, and push. The key difference way to think about what kind of connectivity you need. Now you know you want a device to be connected, or you want a, uh, you know, a tablet or phone to be connected. What is the kind of connectivity you need? You think of brokered is when you want to just create an addressable endpoint, and then both send and receive happen to that endpoint. That's brokered. So you can do send independently, the device doesn't have to be there. You can do receive independently, the device, the, you know, the backend doesn't have to be there. Very decoupled kind of way is what brokered does. You always talk to the entity. Whether it's a queue, you send to the queue or you receive to the queue. Relayed, on the other hand, allows you to create a request response where both the systems have to be available at the same time. Now, this gives you low latency, pretty low latency, but it also does have coupling. But in a lot of scenarios, that's all that is needed. 
is you have a backend service, you have a client making a request, getting a response right away, and it goes from there. So for that, you think about brokered for connectivity. Oh, sorry, relayed for connectivity. There's no buffering of messages in relay. So again, this is all, uh, you need both of them to be available. And finally, push is really dependent on the platform itself. We do do retries. Like, for example, if the Apple notification service is not available, we'll retry again. But once the message is in Apple's hand or in Windows notification services hand, they don't offer any guarantees. They say it's best effort, essentially. So keep that in mind. Like, when you think about notifications, keep that in mind that you can't have critical information going through a notification if you guarantee delivery of that. For that, you would use brokered or relayed. Okay. The next question is about protocol support. So again, when you're thinking about connecting your clients, you really need to think, hey, what protocols does this client support? What can I do? If you use TCP-based persistent connections, then you can definitely get all the rich features and much more efficiency. They actually uh, sort of uh, lower the cost in, uh, in a sense, but they don't have the universal reach of HTTP. And the last point is also to keep in mind, like I talked about earlier, is when you think about connecting these devices, are you looking for durable messaging to them or volatile messaging? Brokered messaging is completely durable. If you want to use it for volatile, you have things like TTL and stuff, but you know, most of the time you would use it for durable messaging. Relay offers just no buffering, request response. And push notification, like I said, is best effort. So in push, you really can't get durable, and you, know, you just keep that in mind when you think about what connectivity you need. With all these considerations, let's look at what some of the real-world options look like for you. When you think of durable messaging scenarios, think of uh, data like orders, like I just showed you, when you have to submit an order, activity streams, chat. All these are very good candidates for relay and brokered, you know, if you have live information and stuff. If you think of uh, volatile scenarios, if you want notifications, there's notification hubs, but if you want in-app notifications, like tickers and stocks and stuff like that, or collaboration second screen apps, here are cases where you really want some low latency and you might not want durability. So those are options available for that. The one uh, aspect I want to touch on a little bit is for all the different client, pla client platforms, folks had brought up this question, there are all these native SDKs and now you have all these protocols on top of that and APIs on top of that. It does get you know, a little complex in a hurry. And we've seen a lot of folks come up with framework solutions which try to address this, this sort of overwhelming nature of this, uh, you know, uh, making these connected applications. SignalR and Socket.io are a couple of these frameworks. They do a terrific job at providing you some key features. Firstly, they're all volatile messaging because remember they're frameworks, right? They, they don't have actually a durable store or anything at the back end, so they're all volatile messaging. They do transport negotiation, which is huge, right? If you think about browsers or if you think about clients, you have all these uh, different scenarios, sometimes Wi-Fi, sometimes wired, transport negotiations a key there. They provide simple APIs across broad platforms. So again, these are very, very good uh, frameworks, both SignalR and Socket.io, if you're using them in browsers especially and over native platforms also. So how to think about service bus when you see these particular platforms. There's a picture for that. <laughs> so you can think about all of these platforms, whether it's connecting to IIS using SignalR or whether it's connecting to you know, Node server using uh, Socket.io. You have lots and lots of these connections going to a single node. The challenge all of them have is what happens when you scale out the backend. What happens when instead of one, you have two IIS servers? How do you get them to talk against each other? That's where Service Bus comes in as a scale-out backplane. So with PubSub messaging, Service Bus has the ability to take all the messages coming to one IIS node and transfer them to the next IIS node and to all the other nodes as a publisher and subscriber. So the scale-out problem which you run into 
with all of these kinds of platforms where they're very good at managing a lot of sockets to a single endpoint. Service bus solves on the back end by scaling it out. And for that, let's quickly take a, a look at a demo. I'm going to show you a SignalR site, which I'm running right now. And this is running on a single data center, but it has four nodes, which are uh, running this workload. So with SignalR, now with a load balancer in front of you, you could land on any of the nodes. I'm going to call this guy left. Okay. So here I've got one browser. And notice it got uh, its connection uh, to the web instance one. I'm going to create one more instance in the browser. Call this guy right. And put this guy here. OK, so what do I have here? Now I have two browser instances, both connected to the same app. But notice how at times they could be hitting different IIS nodes. Even though we are using SignalR to talk between here and the uh, IIS server, we are using service bus between those IIS servers. So let me send some messages through and see what's happening. Third, fourth. OK. So look at all the numbers on there. Every time you send a message, you could be hitting a different IIS node. But every client, even though it is hitting a different one, gets that message. And the only way that's possible is because we're using signal uh, uh, service bus as the back, out, uh, back plane. All of these uh, solutions are available on the web. In fact, uh, today, uh, Clemens Vasters uh, uh, published another blog, uh, a video blog with uh, the uh, Socket IO with uh, Glenn, a nice interview. So do take a look at that if you're planning to use these frameworks. It uh, really helps out in terms of uh, uh, github.com SignalR as well as uh, github.com Windows Azure Socket IO service bus. All this code is available today for you to uh, play around with and try. OK, getting close, hanging there. How's, it, how's everyone doing? Close, good, OK. Security, our favorite uh, topic most of the time. Now, with security, with so many clients and services all trying to talk to each other, you really do need both the options. You need an integrated option, of course. You need integrated auth, you know, single sign-on, all of that goodness. As well as you do need simple auth models, too. Because some of these clients cannot have you know, all the logic of uh, doing uh, single uh, sign-on and uh, authentication. With Service Bus, we now support both those models. Uh, if you attended the talk on uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, Ziv uh, presented uh, uh, SaaS uh, shared access signature in detail. That's the new sort of model. Uh, there are a couple of video blogs which talk about Active Directory integrated auth. But essentially, when you think about uh, AD, you have all the things of uh, you know, uh, simple web tokens being used. You can do send, listen, manage permissions. And essentially, you can integrate that with other identity providers. On the contrary, with shared access signature, you, the new uh, uh, model, you just it's like a username and password on each entity, on a queue, on a topic, on a relay endpoint. And at that point, you can just authenticate through that endpoint itself. You can roll keys. There's a lot of good uh, material out there on the demos. I'm not going to dive into this uh, in a lot of details. But uh, uh, do take a look at that. And here, the clients will all authenticate directly to the entity. There's no other service uh, dependency. So essentially, it's like a username password which you can embed. And we see this a lot of uh, times come up in B2C kind of scenarios, right? consumer app scenarios. You're not going to do an identity and authentication for every consumer. You just need a key which you could roll and sort of disable access in there. Resilience. Another very, very cool topic. So cloud principles. Software will have bugs. People will make mistakes. Hardware will fail. A little depressing. 
its reality. Service bus, how does service bus protect you against that? For hardware, we already take care of node crashes and disk failures. If there is a disk failure, all our data is replicated across three disks, the bad disk goes away, the new disk comes in, it's all good. If there is a node which crashes, load moves from one node to the other node. You might see a little bit of uh, a, you know, a, a few failures there, but quickly the other node will take over in uh, terms of that. For network outages, there is redundancy in the data center for network paths. So if something of within the data center network-wise fails, there's, uh, there's uh, redundant uh, routes which can be used for that. For software, uh, we scale out across roles with active failover. So we have a, you know, a, a layered model in which there's separation of concerns, and, and we do that. I've not listed people here because uh, recently we replaced all people with robots. It's a brand new service bus technology. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> but we do have a lot of processes in place to protect against you know, inadvertent failure, people deleting stuff or anything like that. There's very good uh, auth control uh, for that. But what are the features? What are things which you can use to enable resilience in your services? How to make your service resilient? There are three features I will talk about today. We'll talk about load balancing, retry, and paired namespaces. So let's talk about load balancing first. With relay load balancing, like I said, you can take multiple instances of uh, a service and connect them all to the same relay endpoint. I've got a quick demo here, which I'll load up. So here I've got some senders and receivers. Let, the receiver is what your echo sort of service will be. And all I'm doing here is creating multiple instances of the service, all connecting to the same relay endpoint. At the same point, I've got a few senders. And all these senders do is create a connection and send messages. Whenever they find an error, they abort the channel, sleep for some time, and then retry. So essentially, they're just built into, if you fail, hey, something happened, go retry. Let me run this demo and see what happens. OK, let me lay it out. So I've got three instances of my service on the right. Same service, just three instances. And I've got about uh, seven clients connected to it. With relay load balancing, as each client comes in and asks for a session, it will get load balanced across those three services, the three instances of the services. So here, you're seeing a great example of taking you know, load, which is all coming to a single endpoint, and being able to splatter it across services. Now, failure does happen. And in this case, it's going to be a human error, where I'm going to take the top one, this guy, and I'm just going to kill it. Straight away, you see failures. You see the green failure, and you see the, uh, whatever that color is, I can't tell, some other failure. But as soon as those services reconnect, note what happened. They just got reconnected back to other instances of the service which was still running. So in a terrific sort of uh, natural and simplistic way, you got resilience in your service, because now when the client reconnects, there's another instance of the service already running. Now let's stress this guy out. Let's take this and actually kill him, too. Again, you see a little bit of splutter of failures. Clients reconnect. Everyone is back up and running. And all you had to do was config, same relay endpoint, all different instances of the service. Security, we're done with that. Let me quickly switch out. So do try out the relay load balancing feature. It uh, uh, supports up to 25 concurrent listeners on a single uh, endpoint, so you can really, really scale your service out. With the recent release of SDK uh, 2.1, which we did on May 13th, the two new features we introduced was paired namespaces and uh, client-side retry policy. This was along with the AMQPGA announcement. Client retry is really, really simple. Essentially, we have, we have an operation timeout. And by default, you can set the retry exponential as the retry policy. 
And what that means is that for whatever timeout you've already sup uh, supplied, which by default is 60 uh, seconds, we will keep retrying the operations. And thereby you have a much higher chance of success against intermittent blips and errors. So it really helps improve out of the box the experience which you get with the clients. Now, latencies can vary. If your app is very latency sensitive, then you want to set the operation timeout to a very reasonable value, uh, not keep retrying you know, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, if you're sensitive to that. With paired namespaces, I've got a little bit of a graphic to show you. Essentially, think of paired namespaces as cases where an entire data center goes out. What do you do in that case? Because all the sort of failovers and stuff like that are at per data center layer. So now we have something which is for a um, cross DC kind of uh, scenario. So when things are all hunky dory, messages are flowing from your front end to your back end through service bus queues, essentially, plain and simple. These could be topics to uh, whichever. But now let's say the service bus namespace on top, the, the primary namespace, becomes completely unavailable or your particular queue becomes unavailable. It might not be a DC-wide outage, it might just be your queue. What we will do now is when we try the message and send it and it fails, we will put it in the paired namespace. So you can create this paired namespace in a different geographic region. You can create it in the same geographic region in a different uh, uh, data center. So all of those sort of advantages you'll get where if one call fails, we'll put the message in another uh, namespace. Over time, as messages start flowing back again, we have a siphon pump, uh, a process which will then take the messages from the secondary namespace and put them back into the primary. So from a receiver code wise, your receiver code doesn't have to change. It will just work as is. It's just that the message will show up later once it has been siphoned back. And then your uh, backend can uh, uh, receive that particular uh, message. From an API perspective, this is all that you have to do. You have to make one call on the messaging factory called pair namespace, in which you pass it a paired uh, namespace factory and a paired namespace manager. You create two instances of new objects and you pass in that. Essentially, we will do all the other work which is needed to create transfer queues. Here you see the transfer queue count is set to 10, which means we'll have 10 queues, and you use them as transfer queues. Uh, you can set the siphon to be true or false. Note how I had the siphon on the ba back end. You don't want to run the siphon on your web row. You want to run it on your back end worker row. So you get to choose on which client you uh, enable the siphon. And here are some of the considerations when you're using a, a key, uh, you know, paired namespace. So today we've only got sender availability options, which means your send operations will continue to pass. Note how receive will not pass till your message is siphoned back. So till the main queue doesn't become unavailable, receive won't be there. We are working on that feature, but it's not available right now. Sessions, scheduled messages, all these features continue to work as is. Ordering, however, is lost. So if your app is very ordering sen sensitive, then definitely use sessions. But in general, because of the transfer queue um, aspect, you do lose ordering in there. And then end-to-end -end receive latency can vary because when the primary queue is unavailable, you have to wait for that to come back. The way to think about setting your transfer queue is size. Essentially, how long an outage uh, do you want to go? Uh, you know, how can, uh, can it uh, handle? Generally, 10 is more than enough. And then, like I said, siphon can be uh, uh, selectively uh, started. You can provision your own secondary uh, namespace. Uh, from a billing implication, I just did want to call out that regular message operations do apply. So a send operation uh, to the primary failing and then a send operation to the secondary is a send operation. The siphon receives the message and re enqueues it, so that's another you know, sort of operation. So the resiliency in that it just counts in terms of the messaging uh, operations in there. Whew, that's it. So uh, we went through all the different uh, messaging challenges which uh, clients generally see in terms of uh, large number of uh, connections. And uh, hopefully um, you've seen how uh, Service Bus uh, provides you with a rich set of uh, functionality, both for your clients and uh, services. Uh, there's a uh, couple more uh, good sessions uh, coming on. Please do uh, try to uh, uh, 
take a look at those later in the day today. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much.